Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joseph Gildenhorn, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And on behalf of the Center and the Council of the Americas, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this public forum with the distinguished President of Mexico, Felipe Calderon Hinojosa. Uh, let me welcome you, Mr. President. Welcome to Washington, and we're just very pleased that you're here. It's, uh, at this time, I'd like to also recognize a few of uh, other members of the audience who are accompanying you. Uh, we're delighted to have in attendance the First Lady, Margarita Zavala. <laughs> the Secretary of Foreign Relations, Patricia Espinosa. Secretary of the Economy, Bruno Ferrari. And Ambassador Arturo Sarukin, a very good friend of mine. And Arturo is a very good friend of the Wilson Center and the Wilson Council. Thank you, Arturo. I'd also like to recognize the presence of two former ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors to Mexico, Jim Jones and John Negroponte. John is chairman of the Council of the Americas, uh, one of our sponsors today, and it's nice having John here. We also have with us Roger Wallace, who together with Jose Antonio Fernandez, have led the advisory board of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Mexico Institute since its inception. Uh, unfortunately, Jose could not be with us today, but we certainly have uh, Mr. Wallace here, Roger Wallace, and thank you for coming. <clears throat> We're also pleased to have with us today the former Secretary of the Interior and Governor of Arizona, Bruce Babbitt, and also Hattie Babbitt, former ambassador to the Organization of American States. We're also pleased to have with us former Congressman Jim Colby and former Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, Robert Bonner. I'm extremely pleased that many board members of the Wilson Center and members of the Council of the Americas are with us today. And let me acknowledge Susan Siegel of the uh, Council of Americas for her participation and co-sponsorship of this event today. Finally, I would like to thank Andrew uh, Galfuso and the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center for partnering with us again, once again uh, today. Andrew serves as the Director of the Office for Trade Promotion at this International Trade Center, which is our host today. Andrew would like to say a few words, and I would ask him to, to speak. Andrew? Thank you, Ambassador. Benvenidos a Washington, Presidente Calderon Hinojosa y Primera Dama. Good afternoon and welcome to the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center, a special project of the United States General Services Administration and a unique public-private sector partnership. Thanks to the foresight of the government and the people involved in creating this project, uh, we're able to host phenomenal events like the one we have here today. I'd like to welcome our partners, the Woodrow Wilson Center, including their new director, President and CEO, the Honorable Jane Harmon, a special welcome to the Americas Society and Council of the Americas, as well as all the invited guests here today. At 3.1 million square feet, the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center is the largest building in Washington, D.C., and is often considered the crown jewel of Pennsylvania Avenue. This is the second largest federal building after the Pentagon, and as a mixed-use facility, the International Trade Center houses numerous public and private sector tenants including the U.S. Agency for International Development, offices of the U.S. Commercial Service, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, 
the Environmental Protection Agency, and several other private sector tenants. The Reagan Building also serves as a special events venue with 27 <laughs> conference rooms and five-star catering and service. All of these groups coexist right here in a secure government-owned building with an inviting atmosphere that's open to the public year-round. As one of DC's premier event venues, the building hosts over 1,500 events annually, from gala dinners to conferences to trade shows and symposiums. The Reagan Building is also the World Trade Center of Washington, D.C. We're affiliated with the World Trade Center Association, a nonprofit, nonpolitical global association that links importers and exporters among 320 World Trade Centers in 90 countries. As the nation's official trade center, we fulfill our mandate by collaborating with an extended network of partners like the ones you see here today. In the past year, we've held over 200 international trade events, most notable the annual conference of the National Council by the, um, U, uh, by the U.S. Arab Relations, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act Forum, the Chinese Council for the Promotion of International Trade, as well as the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, which is happening today here as we speak. Again, we're pleased to host you here, and we hope you have a fantastic day. I'm going to now turn the mic back to Ambassador Gildenhorn. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Andrew. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Jane Harmon, the Director, President, and CEO of the Woodrow Wilson Center, and while I recognize Jane, I would also like to recognize Sidney Harmon, uh, husband of Jane and a good friend of many, many years. Uh, until only a few days ago, Jane was a leader in the U.S. Congress uh, as a representative from California. She was known for her commitment to building bipartisan consensus, and she led the dis discussions on critical international policy issues and was a leading voice on homeland security. During her tenure in Congress, Jane served as a prominent member of several House committees, including the Committee on Homeland Security, the Committee on Energy and Commerce, and the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. We're very proud at the Wilson Center to have Jane as the president, an institution dedicated to convening stakeholders on key public issues in a neutral and nonpartisan environment. I know that Jane will bring the same energy, intellect, and leadership to the Center that she's demonstrated in Congress, and we're so pleased to have her leading the Wilson Center. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Jane Harmon, to who will introduce the President. Thank you, Joe, and warmest greetings to many dear friends who are right in front of me, including my own husband. Uh, we, are, we at the Wilson Center are deeply honored that President Calderon chose the Wilson Center and the Council of Americas under Susan Siegel's able, able leadership to co-host uh, his public address in Washington. Uh, I attended uh, what I believe is the President's last public address in this, co in this country uh, when I was a member of Congress, and he spoke to a joint session last May. At that session, he called on Congress to restore the ban on the manufacture of 19 classes of assault weapons, among other things. And I want him to know that many in Congress, but sadly not a majority, agree with him that there are too many guns in America, and many of those guns, especially assault weapons, travel to Mexico, where they create enormous problems uh, for the citizens of Mexico. There are few countries, if any, that matter more to the United States than Mexico. We share a 2,000-mile border. Mexico is a critical trading partner. Earlier today, Presidents Obama and Calderon agreed to lift 50 percent of the current tariffs on trucks that cross our border, so long as the truck drivers comply with safety and security standards. As a resident of California, I know how big this problem has been, and it surely will save consumers in both countries billions of dollars and pesos. Mexico is the country of origin or heritage for over one in 10 Americans. The family ties across the border only strengthen our political and economic ties. What happens in Mexico has a profound impact on the United States and vice versa. I know this firsthand 
again coming from California, which is now a Latino majority state and proud to be that. A majority of California's Latino population is Mexican American. And so much of California's glorious culture is inspired or actually imported directly from Mexico. President Calderon is a strong, committed, and courageous leader. He has confronted organized crime head on while he has charted a course for economic growth in his country. Since assuming the presidency in 2006, he has taken on trafficking organizations that preyed on Mexicans. Today, many of the top leaders of those organizations are behind bars or not alive. President Calderon has also overseen major constitutional reforms of the justice system and the police. He has made clear that the long-term future of his country depends on having police, prosecutors, and courts that are trustworthy and effective. And Mexico is becoming a model that many other countries in this world can learn from. To do this, he is working closely with the United States. American consumption of illegal narcotics drives the drug trade. And money and guns from this country, as I said, fuel the violence. President Obama and President Calderon and their administrations have developed unprecedented cooperation to address these challenges as a shared responsibility. Just last month, the U.S. lost an Immigration and Customs Enforcement officer in the line of duty, Jaime Zapata. The attack on Mr. Zapata and his colleague, Victor Avila, is a tragedy and reinforces the requirement that our two countries continue to work closely to stop the flow of guns and drugs across our shared border. Both countries face presidential elections next year in 2012. And what happens or doesn't happen on the border will be a major factor, factor in both elections. Election rhetoric, as most of us know, and I certainly know personally, can often become heated and destructive. And so the Wilson Center and the Council of the Americas will work closely together to help build a solid foundation to assure that our close relationship survives the election season intact. In conclusion, true leaders are made in times of crisis, and new policy directions are forged by them. President Calderon has seen his share of difficult moments, but he has risen to the occasion and made Mexico stronger through his efforts. He told me earlier today that in 2002 he considered becoming a scholar at the Wilson Center, and I want him to know, and I'm sure that uh, the chairman of our board will agree, that when his presidency is over, we will welcome him as a scholar at the Wilson Center. So, in my first week as president and CEO of the Wilson Center, I am honored that my first public address is to introduce a courageous leader, Felipe Calderon, the president of Mexico. Thank you. Thank you for your words, Mrs. President. Uh, well, thanks all of you for to be here this afternoon. And thank you to the Woodrow Wilson Center along with the Council of the Americas. Thank you to Jane Harmon and Susan Siegel for this invitation. It is an honor for me to be here. Back in the first decades of the 20th century, when Woodrow Wilson was president of the United States, Mexico was a rural country with a population of 15 million. The average life expectancy was 30 years, and 80% of the population could not read and write. It was a Mexico struggling through a civil war, a society fought for democracy and justice. It was a Mexico just starting out on the path to prosperity and development. Today, Mexico is a very different country. 
Now we have a population of 112 million, and we are a largely urban country with a life expectancy of 75 years. And Mexico is one of the largest economy in the world, a democracy in which people enjoy the rights our ancestors fought for. But uh, big challenges still remain. And we are working really hard to transform Mexico into a safer, more prosperous, and just nation. And our pride in our past achievements is the foundations on which we are building a better future. In other words, we are making every effort to become a stronger nation that contributes to a stronger North America. This is essential for all of us because, as a region, we have common problems that require joint solutions if we are to build a future of shared prosperity. Mexico is a country undergoing a profound transformation built, built on the principles and values of democracy. These changes are happening in every phase of life and are making us stronger every day. In the political arena, we have a vibrant and plural democracy based on free elections, a system of checks and balances, and active civil society that not only exercises its rights and freedoms, but also calls the authorities to account. But we are also a young democracy. And as such, we are in the process of building and strengthening our institutions. In particular, we are improving those that are essential to making Mexico a country where the rule of law prevails everywhere and for everyone. And this is the necessary condition for Mexico to become a truly modern state and join the ranks of developed nations. One of our main challenges is, without questions, public safety. As we all know, criminal organizations were allowed to grow and strengthen over many years to a degree that, uh, in some parts of the country, local authorities were enabled to deal with them. This is why we decided to face the problem head on with the full force of the state. We are working to make Mexico safe for everyone. We are going to make sure that anyone who breaks the law faces the consequences. And let me share with you how we are doing this. First, in order to stop violent criminals organizations and to support local governments that were overwhelmed, my administration deployed the federal police and the armed forces. This is a temporary measure to give the states and municipalities time to rebuild and strengthen their security and judicial institutions. Second, we are building up a new generation of police forces. The federal police has gone through a deep purge to put an end to corruption, and we have not only multiplied the number of federal policemen, but now they are also better trained, better equipped, and better paid. But under the Mexican Constitution, the federal forces cannot do it all by themselves. So they also need support for modernized local and state police forces. That is why we are supporting local authorities in their efforts to modernize and rebuild their own institutions. Third, one of the major transformations Mexico has undergone in my administration has been the reform of the judicial system. Slowly but surely, we are building more efficient, effective, and transparent institutions to enforce the law in Mexico. Instead of an inquisitorial, slow, and op opaque system, we are moving to a system based on oral and open trials, just like the ones you have here in the United States. Not only will justice be done, everyone will be able to see it is being done. Fourth, we are also tackling the social causes of crime by investing heavily in education and health, opening rehabilitation centers for addicts, taking back public spaces for our communities, and making our schools safe for our children. 
as we anticipated, the fight against organized crime takes time, cost, money, and sadly, human lives as well. Such as the case of a special agent Jaime Zapata, who died recently at the hands of merciless gunmen while helping to make North America a safer place. We share the pain of this loss with his family, friends, and colleagues at ICE. We have already arrested the main suspects in this case who will not have to face justice. Hi, James' death is added to the sacrifice of hundreds of brave Mexican policemen and soldiers who have lost their lives fighting organized crime and helping to keep drugs off of our streets and out our homes in Mexico and in the United States. But now, more than ever, we cannot ignore the fact that organized crime is a transnational problem. It has its origins on both sides of the border, and it's clear and present danger to all our citizens. It is clear to me that the solution must come from both sides of the border as well. We have found renewed cooperation to face this problem in the Obama administration, but there is no doubt that more must be done, and very soon. Particularly when it comes to dismantling the financial operation of criminal organizations in the U.S. and reducing American demand for drugs. In the short term, it is vital to halt the uncontrolled sale of assault weapons to criminals that are not being used, not just against Mexican citizens and security personnel, but as we have seen, can also be used against U.S. law enforcement officials and citizens. Make no mistake, the future prosperity of Mexico, the U.S., and the North American region is at stake. Mexico is fully committed to doing our part. We also know that to transform Mexico into a safer, and more, more prosperous country, we must improve the living, the living conditions of our citizens. That is why we are working hard through active public policies to level the playing field, the, the playing field for all Mexicans, so that each and every person has the same opportunity in life. This includes the continuous improvement of education, healthcare, and housing. We have made great achievements in this regard. As an example, our health care reform has been very successful. In the year 2000, only 45 million Mexicans had access to the public health system. And today, the figure has grown to 93 million. And very soon, we will reach universal health care coverage this is a great accomplishment that many countries aspire to, but only a few have been able to achieve. Let me tell you that in the last four years, we have built more than 1,000 new hospitals or clinics in Mexico and rebuilt more than 1,500 more. So that implied that we are providing health services for almost all Mexican people. And we will achieve this or next year, our goal, a doctor, medicine, hospital, and treatment for, any, for every single Mexican people. We are also working hard to transform our economy into one that is stronger and more competitive. I'm talking about education, by the way. In the last four years, we have created 90 new universities in Mexico. And we expand the campus of 45 more in the country. And we have created more than 800 new high schools in Mexico, specially oriented towards technical aspects. So in that sense, today, there are more than 90,000 new engineer, engineers or technicians in Mexico every year more than in Germany, more in Brazil, 
or more than in Canada. Uh, and that implies that we are improving the competitiveness of our economy and providing more opportunities for young, for young people. Uh, as I was saying, we are also working in order to transform the Mexican economy into one that is stronger and more competitive, one that makes Mexico a better partner for the United States. Today, as the 14th largest economy in the world, Mexico is a major economy power in its own right. Our financial house is in order. Mexico, Mexico's fiscal deficit, for instance, and um, public debt are well below the OECD average. Our public deficit, including the debt of Pemex, is more or less 2% of GDP. And the public debt in Mexico is more or less of, of uh, the public sector, the government, is more or less 34% of GDP. Actually, we have already more than $121 billion at the central bank, which is more than double of our total external debt, very different from other occasions when we suffer a lot in terms of economic crisis. Last year, we have 2010, it was a very good year for Mexico in economic terms. At the beginning of the year, I remember the forecasts of several firms we're talking about that Mexico, they could expect to grow about 2.5 or 3 percent. But at the end of the year, we grew 5.5 percent. And we have created 80, 850,000 new formal jobs in net terms. Um, I'm not talking about opinion pools. I'm talking about formal jobs, meaning by that the number of net workers, new net workers uh, registered at the Mexican Social Security Institute, which means the payment of the quotas to the IMSS, so which is the highest number ever in Mexico in terms of job creation. Our export, mainly export of vehicles, for instance, the productions of vehicles and export of vehicles last year grew by more than 50%. And we passed from our market share in the American import market, passed from less than 10% less than towards more than 12% in only, in only two years. Um, we are very committed with free trade. We have not only NAFTA with the United States and Canada, but also we have free trade agreements with 44 countries around the world. So the people or the enterprises that produce in Mexico are able to export to more than one billion people or one billion consumers in the world, which make Mexico one of the most competitive uh, countries in the global arena. I remember every single meeting of G20, starting here in Washington, by the way, with President Bush. And I remember every single meeting we express some kind of uh, formal resolution in the sense that we are against protectionism and we refuse uh, imposing new tariffs to trade and we support the Doha round and so on. But the day after, at least 15 out of those 20 countries established one way or another new tariffs and new barriers to the trade. In the case of Mexico, it was the other way around. So in 2008, we had, on average, almost 15%, 12% in terms of uh, tariffs, and we reduced tariffs towards more or less 5% today. And what happened with that? A lot of enterprises in Mexico were afraid that we were going to lose the competition against other industries around the world, but it was very different. So Mexican economy became more competitive even. Actually, our export reached last month in January the highest number ever. And uh, we are gaining competitiveness according to several 
research. For instance, the World Bank index, the so-called Doing Business Index. When I took office in 2006, Mexico had the place number 73. And today, Mexico has the number 35. So we are well ahead of the other Latin American countries, and even we are ahead of other countries like the BRICS countries, for instance. We are gaining competitiveness. We are gaining competitiveness according, for instance, with United Nations in talking about the confidence of foreign direct investment, and we are gaining competitiveness in other segments. For instance, today Mexico is the cheapest country in order to produce manufacturing to export to U.S. One refrigerator produced in Mexico, even today, is like 8% cheaper than any single refrigerator made in China. And of course, that is provoking very strong competitiveness in Mexico and the creation of a lot of jobs in the manufacturing sector. And there are several reasons of that. Uh, one is, of course, the reduction of tariffs, and that allow the private companies to get access to better inputs for their production. They are more competitive than that. The other is the investment that we are doing in education, mainly oriented towards uh, engineers and technicians that I mentioned it already. Other is the investment that we are producing or we are making in infrastructure sector. Let me tell you that uh, the average in the last administration of President Fox investing in infrastructure was below 3% of GDP. The average among the, or between the countries of OECD is 3.4% of GDP in infrastructure. Now we are investing more or less 5% of GDP in infrastructure, which means more than $50 billion a year in Mexico. So in four years, we have built more highways and more roads than any other government and more highways than all the kilometers made in the decade of the 90s, for instance. We are providing better conditions for, for the people. And we are, there are another measures that we are putting in place in the economy. For instance, a very strong deregulation process. We erased last year more than 15,000 rules or notes or norms in the government. We are er erasing this, uh, eliminating a necessary regulation, and the Mexican enterprises are gaining competitiveness. At the same time, we are giving to tourism an unprecedented boost by upgrading the infrastructure in that area and promoting tourist attraction globally. And finally, we are carrying out a set of structural reforms that have been postponed for decades. For instance, the pension system reform for public, public servants. This is a common challenge for several nations, including the United States. But we made a reform, I remember, only in the Social Security Institute five years ago, I remember when the former uh, director of the institution tried to make a small reform on that, there, wa there were a huge protests and rallies against that, and finally he failed. Today, we made a reform in, in terms of the pension system in the Social Security Institute, in the CFE Company of Electricity. We proceed with the liquidation of uh, the other electricity company, Lucy Fuerza, so we fix the problem of pension as well. Um, so we made a reform in the East State, which, which means the pension system for all public servants. And with that, passing from the traditional pay-as-you-go system to the, an individual account system we are saving for public finances 
more than 30 points of GDP at net present value. So it was a huge structural reform in Mexico. Other we made with almost two tax reform in Mexico, very painful, yes, I recognize with huge political cost, but we reduce our dependence on oil revenues. And finally, we made a reform in the energy sector, allowing private contracts with Pemex in terms, to, in terms to improve the competitiveness of oil industry. Um, I need to say that it was almost a capital sin even to talk about oil in Mexico, but we made a reform. And probably it was not the touchdown we wanted in order to make Pemex the leader in the world as Petrobras is in Brazil with similar process, but we made a very good first and 10, uh, and with a very long pass on that, and we are <laughs> waiting for next movement in that. So even regardless the difficulties in political arena in Mexico, we are making changes and we are reaching agreement with the Congress and we are able to modify the structure of the Mexican economy. So all those changes have made Mexico a more vibrant economy and an ideal place for companies to expand their operations and seek new business opportunities. And as we transform our economy into one that is stronger and more competitive, Mexico is also becoming even more critical for the economic success of the United States. We need to say that Mexican people, we, are the second best buyers of American products around the world. No? And depending on our purchases of American products, more than one million of American families are having jobs and income. And that is a very important issue regarding trade. We need to remember to everyone that the expansion of trade implies a win-win situation for everyone, for buyers, for exporters, for importers, for consumers, and for producers. So we need to remember in our region the power of the trade. And we need to remember any single day to the citizens and voters how important the trade is. If we want to guarantee our mutual prosperity, we need to go even further to maintain North America's competitiveness over all the regions in the world. And we need to remember that we are not competing Mexican against Americans. We are competing as a region against Asian products, European products, and others. And the only way to win this competition is to use the advantages that the mutual complementarities between Mexican and American economy have. So that implies to understand, it's like a textbook case, that there is a big economy with uh, abundant in capital, and there is another small economy abundant in labor, and the only way in which you can gain competitiveness is mixing the factors of that. The only way in which you can produce better products, a cheaper price, is using the advantage of complementarity. And that is the issue related with the trade between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. In brief, we need more integration, not less. North America as a whole, must to be ready, must be ready to compete against those regions of the world that are developing fast like Asia. Therefore, integration is the key to restoring and maintaining strong and sustained growth in North America as a whole. The NAFTA was a very important step in that direction, but we must work to deepen our ties further and build on this foundation. Now we are passing um, some difficult times, I understand, but uh, at the very end, I know that facing the problems, 
like in old times, facing the poor problems is the only way to fix them. And in Mexico, we are facing the problems. We are fixing the problems. We are not ignoring or avoiding the cost of the solution. And that is the case in terms of uh, security issues, and that is the case in terms of structural changes for more prosperity. Um, just as protectionism and economic isolation were obstacles to innovation and growth until the 90s, the current North American immigration system has become the new bottleneck for growth and prosperity in the region. Sooner or later, we will need an immigration reform. And sooner is better than later, because migration is a natural phenomenon between our two countries. In fact, it has been going, it has been going on for as long as the United States and Mexico have existed. And now the lack of a comprehensive and effective legal framework has led to some states of the Union proposing their own legislation. Let me tell you, I don't like to be a president or a Mexican seeing other Mexicans exposing their lives and looking for better opportunities in North America. I don't like the figure of more than 400 Mexican people who died every single year trying to cross the border. I don't want to see um, our towns uh, I, as a very distinguished former governor of Michoacan, I'm from, present here, I'm from Michoacan, and I don't like to see our towns with only women or old people and some children. We are losing in every single migrant the best of our people, the bravest people, the hard worker people, the leaders of the communities. So we are working really hard in Mexico in order to create the condition that allow them to have job opportunities in our country. We are not enjoying migration. But we recognize that that is a fact, that is a natural economic and social phenomenon. And the best thing that we can do is to build the legal framework that allow to allocate or accommodate that process in a natural way. And beyond the short term, we need to work together in order to provide the conditions and to use the huge uh, natural and human resources we have in order to create prosperity in our countries. So that our responsibility is to ensure migration happens in a legal and orderly way so that the American economy is strengthened and Mexicans do not have to die while trying to get a job and contribute to regional prosperity. It's quite interesting to analyze some research here in the States that talk about the contributions of migrants to the American growth in the last century. We cannot understand that without this natural phenomenon. So under the values we share as neighbors and partners, we need to find creative solutions to this common problem and help the many workers who today live in the shadows of society. The closer together we are, the more competitive we will be and the more we will grow. We must act together to generate new markets for our common exports. We must work hand in hand to solve our common challenges. We must understand that true competition lies not between us, but between our region and the rest of the world. Mexicans are working to build a better nation, a stronger and safer country a more competitive economy, and a more effective democracy. 
In 2011, however, no nation can succeed without the support of its strategic partners. The United States and Mexico are walking towards an uncertain future together, and the more we cooperate, the more we can build secure and prosperous lives for our peoples both sides of the border. Our border doesn't separate us. It unites us through our collective history, our common ideals, and our shared values. Let me close by quoting President Woodrow Wilson in an address to the Congress in 1918. We cannot be separated in interest or divided in purpose. We stand together until the end. This is our reality and must be our commitment. Thank you very much for your attention. Mr. President, thank you for that outstanding speech. Um, we are now open to take some questions. I think you are to write the questions and pass them over to Eric. Uh, uh, and in the meantime... No, Pauline, that's no problem with me. What? Okay. I do prefer oral, oral questions. You would prefer oral questions. Okay. <laughs> but Mr. President... I've been told I get to ask the first question. Is that so? Is that okay? <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Um, oral is even better. Um, you, when you pick up the newspaper, as you said, you read about all of the problems confronting Mexico. But the economic reality and the way the economy is performing says something totally different. As you mentioned, Mexico had 5.5% growth in 2010, and you had a huge amount of foreign direct investment almost at levels of 2008. Could you expand a little bit about that? Because that's very contradictory to a lot of what you read in the newspaper. All right. Can I do it? Absolutely. Okay. Well, the point is, uh, so if you read the newspaper or read the internet every day, so you, the only conclusion you can have is Mexico is a, a this is no way, it's an absolutely disaster, but it, that is not true, no? So we have a growing economy. We have 35 million people, students, going to the school every single year. We have a very healthy economy. We are growing at 5.5%, which is the third largest number in 30 years in our economy. We, let me tell you, the goal that we established in the, the National Development Plan in 2006-07 was to end my administration creating 800,000 jobs on average at the very end. We are creating already 150,000. So that's reality. I cannot ignore the, percep the problem that we have in terms of the problems we have and the perception about the problems and the situation of Mexico. But let me be honest, we are doing what? Well, uh, at least in the economic sector. And that is possible because we are having a strong responsibility managing public finances. And let me tell you that I remember another meeting of G20. And I was with Mr. Carstens, the former Secretary of Hacienda. And we were listening, all the people talking about, uh, no, it's not time to, to put the brakes. So we need to follow the expansionary monetary and fiscal policy because uh, maybe later we can design some kind of exit strategy. And we talk to each other and say, well, it sounds good, 
but we have no options. That year, that uh, 2009 was a terrible year for, for us, let me tell you. We suffered the recession, so our economy went down by more than 6%. And then the flu outbreak came in 2009, so we suffered a lot. And then the wars drove ever in Mexico. And the organized crime being very active that year, so. But the most serious problem we faced that year, it's uh, fell down in oil production. We, will, we lost that year more than 200,000 barrels a day because the natural um, declination, that's mm -hmm. correct? The, the natural decline of our oil fields. Mm -hmm. So we say to each other, so it sounds good to expand our economy, but we have not that option. So we need to start the exit strategy right now. And when we made that, I proposed a bill to the Congress to raise taxes at a very political, a very expensive political price. We reduce the expenditure of the government. Actually, we close the Luce Fuerza company, the electricity company, which implied that year more than $5 billion a year in terms of the budget. And that was a very hard decision because it implies to, to close the labor relationship with more than 44,000 workers. So very tough decision. But at the very end, we were right. And a few months later, we started to see other nations participating in the G20, suffering a lot of troubles. Uh, or not participating there, but finally Greece and Ireland and Portugal and Spain started to suffer a lot. And we say, <coughs> oh, we, we took the right decision. And now it's... Uh, it's paying off our decision, that is good. The other is the structural transformation that we are making. And either the deregulation process or the fiscal and pension system reform or the reduction of tariffs, all of that are working in favor of economic growth. And we need to go beyond that. And the next reform that we are acting is, for instance, in telecommunication sector. By first time, in several years, or I, I would to say, by first time in decades in Mexico, we supply to several participants the frequencies of the government. You know that there are very hard players in telecommunications in Mexico in every single sector, either uh, telephone companies or television. We are supplying more frequencies because we are going to break the obstacles to entrance in the market. And we are pushing right now in the Congress a labor reform in order to do the labor market more flexible. All of those things are very difficult in political terms, but we, we need to do that. And all of that will provide Mexican economy more competitiveness. At the end of the day, that will imply more jobs and more opportunities for the people. That's Thank more or less my answer. Thank you Thank very you. much. You want to do it today? Yeah. Um, how about back there with the paper, right there? Can you say who you are, please? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Hello. Thank you, Mr. President. I am Francisco Meneses. I'm an economist from Chile. Considering the last economic situations during 2009 in Mexico, have you thought of doing a contra-cyclical policy fund like Norway or Chile to protect Mexico's economy from variations in U.S. economy and oil prices. A fund like Norway or Chile to protect variations in your economy. Thank you. Well, if, 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 if I understand your question, is related with the stabilization fund, like exactly. the copper fund, isn't it? Exactly. Well, actually, when I, when I was congressman and the leader of the panel in the Congress, I'm missing those years, by the way. <laughs> so it's easier to be in, in the opposition, by the way. But, uh, what, uh, 
but uh, I do prefer to stay here, eh? let me tell you. <laughs> I do prefer the problems to be in power, instead the problems to be out of power. Don't, uh. Well, we propose a special stabilization fund of oil. Uh, actually, it worked very well. And in 2009, when we lost these 200,000 barrels a day in productions, and we, we observed this fell down in terms of income tax revenues due to the crisis. Can you guess where, do, where did we get the money from? So we used the stabilization fund and we, it was very useful. So the, thing, the problem that we had is we, we, over with, so we, we ended the funds and we need to, to reestablish, but we are moving ahead in that direction. But yes, it was a very good idea, and we learned that from, from the copper fund. Actually, I had a, a very good Chile, Ch Chilean teacher, uh, Hugo Mena, and he was very excited about that. And I didn't believe at the beginning, but finally, when, when you have a crisis like this, believe me, it works a lot. Oh my God. Over, so. over there, young lady, right there. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, good afternoon, President Calderon. Uh, my name is Marta Gomez. I'm from Monterrey, Mex Mexico. And uh, I have a question uh, based on what you mentioned about the need of immigra an immigration reform at some point in the near future. Uh, what are some of the measurements the federal government is considering taking to receive hundreds of deported migrants from the U.S. who belong to Central America and are settling in the border cities of Mexico and in certain way are affecting the state budget of these cities? Thank you very much. Well, it's a very good question. For instance, we are receiving not extradited, deported people. I can't remember the figure you say, half a million a year? Yeah, probably. So we are receiving more or less half a million, a little bit less, deported people into Mexico. Almost 60,000 60, of them a year in Ciudad Juarez. So you can imagine the kind of problem, troubles we have in Ciudad Juarez. That is part of the explanation. And it's uh, unfair, let me tell you. Uh, we need to improve together with the United States, this public policy regarding the, the these this deported people. Why? Because maybe we can do something in order to bring them to their own towns. Let me observe or understand another failure on that. A lot of them had problem with justice here in the state. But for a lot of uh, attorney general office at local level maybe or fiscal office it's cheaper to deport if, if he is Mexican or Honduran or Salvadoreño it's cheaper to them to leave them at the border so that is part of the explanation of the problems that we are facing now part of the solution is we are trying to allocate more public resources coming from federal government in order to fix the problem. Let me talk about Juarez. Oh, the worst case we have in Mexico is Ciudad Juarez in terms of violence. There are a lot of uh, sources of that. The main is the cartels are fighting each other for the control of the gate to U.S. in order to export drugs, which is the old business, and in order to have the control of the market, retail market in Ciudad Juarez, which is the new business. That is part of the problem. The other is the deport, deported or extradited people there. Uh, a lot of young people, uh, working mothers in Ciudad Juarez, and young people and teenagers without opportunities of education and so on. So we are fighting them really hard. And I sent uh, to Juarez at the beginning thousands of uh, soldiers. And after I withdraw the soldiers, and we sent thousands of federal police, and they are gaining control of that step by step. But at the same time, we put in place a very aggressive, if I can say that, a very aggressive social policy in Ciudad Juarez. And now, uh, forget the fact that in the last decade, or in the 90s, 
the education was decentralized. So education is a local responsibility and health is a local responsibility. But despite, the, regardless of that fact, we are now building in Ciudad Juarez five new high schools or preparatorias and we are building two, three more, three new campuses there. So three new universities, in fact. And we are providing scholarships to uh, thousands of young people there. And we are providing social security, Seguro Popular to Juarez. So we are doing the tasks in the social sector. And that's, that's the way we need to proceed. Supporting from the federal government more those cities with problems. But I need to say that we need some kind of co-responsibility of local authorities. Because probably we are generating, uh, how do you say this, uh, a moral hazard there. As long we are fixing their problem, they are not putting enough effort in order to build their own police, in order to build new schools, in order to build new universities. So we need to find out some kind of equilibrium there. Uh, Mr. President Calderon, uh, my name is Jose Luis Gutierrez. I'm the di Associate Director of NAILAC, and I'm from the state of Michoacán. So oh, I'm going to make a very simple question from Paisano to Paisano. Uh, uh, we, migrants in the United States, we've been asking the Mexican government for a coherent immigration law in Mexico. Because for us, it's very hard to ask the, Mexi the, the United States government to respect our rights and to give us the treatment that we deserve. When they tell us, well, you should put pressure also in the Mexican government. And now we're American very excited. Yeah, the, the Mexican government. Mm -hmm. Now we're very excited because last week, actually on Thursday, we were in the Mexican Senate and they passed a bill creating the Mexican immigration law that is very generous. I think it's a coherent law and now it's going to the Camera de Diputados, the Chamber of Debris. So my question is, are you going to sign the bill? No. And, you know, because I think it's for way for you, it's a way for you to pass to history, being our friend or ally, and uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, well, first, let me tell you that we realize how important is this coherence that you say. Uh, actually, starting my government, I proposed a bill in order to uh, derogar, abrogar, abrogate, the the abrogate immigration as a crime in Mexico. And is not a crime anymore since three years ago in Mexico. And second, we establish a friendly policy with migrants coming from Central America. We are cleaning up the house because there was a lot of corruption and immigration institute. We started to, uh, so now the problem we have, or the migrants, the most serious problems the Central American migrants have in Mexico is not the government, it's organized crime as well. And talking about the bill, the answer is yes, I propose the bill. No? And that is the idea to sign this bill you say about the new law of immigration. Even more, we are creating a special visa for Guatemaltecos in the sense that any single Guatemalteco will be able to visit any single border state in Mexico without on any other requirement than uh, his or her visa. And we will provide as much visas that are required for Guatemaltecan people. That's more or less the idea. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, we are dealing with a lot of problems with that, but I do believe on that. And believe me, Central American workers are really hard workers and are doing, are improving the economy of Chiapas, for instance, and other, and other states in the border. So I do believe on that. Uh, it is impossible to stop migration. We need to understand that. And only uh, for the understanding of everyone. So I need to say that there are four millions of Michoacanos in Michoacan. 
but there are two millions of Michoacanos here in the state, so, so including us here. <laughs> All right. Huh? Mr. President, this is actually an opportunity to get lynched. So this, they tell me this is your last question, so. So me, we, I can take like two groups of three questions? Two. I don't know, what is the time we have? Mr. Uh, Mr. Ambassador? Okay. Okay, forget about it. Okay. Okay, so brief. We we, I'll try to be brief, and okay. if you can do that the same. Two, two groups of three questions? Yes. Okay. Very brief question, please. One there, one here, but really brief, and, and one over there. And let's stand up, identify yourself, and then we'll do the other three. Hello, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Scott Shalene. I go to uh, George Washington University. Um, my question is, uh, this is more of a domestic issue in the United States, but uh, like you said, you called for uh, comprehensive immigration reform, and we're going to need to do that here, too. Uh, there are millions of, I don't know the exact number, but I know there's a high number of uh, illegal immigrants who have been in this country for a long time. Uh, what do you see as the best solution uh, for, the, for the current people that are here illegally? Thank you. The second one. The second one is right here. Good afternoon, Mr. President, uh, Calderon, and members of the board, and the single guests. Uh, Alfredo Diaz, Miami, Florida. Two questions. Number one is, are there any plans for Petromex to start selling gasoline along the borders in California and Texas, uh, like Russia starts selling gasoline in New York? And the second question is, have you, since the Obama administration is so concerned about human rights, have you administration asked directly to have uh, the Obama administration to have Northern Command to participate in the safety programs? Say, I'm sorry, say again, please. Uh, yeah, have, have you administration asked the Obama administration if directly the Northern Command would participate in the sponsorship of security between the United States and Mexico? Thank you. Welcome, Mr. President. I'm Timothy Tell, a retired U.S. diplomat. Uh, congratulations on your fight against drug cartels. Um, we, you mentioned the elections next year. Certain press in the United States says that the old-fashioned pre that might get back in office are not as vigorous and dynamic as you are against the flagello of drug trafficking, money laundering, and international crime. Does that mean the, the great accomplishments that you and the Mexican people have, have achieved are going to be halted and turned around? Oh, that's an easy question. <laughs> Why do you think? Huh? Why do you think this, Susana? I don't, well, let me, well, thank, uh, I think uh, the comprehensive immigration reform that, uh, and in particular, the DREAM Act that was discussed in Congress, it was a very good one. Uh, regardless of that fact, and unfortunately, it didn't pass. I think it is possible, still today, to make another effort to pass that. But before, we need to change the general perception inside the public opinion in America and the public opinion in Mexico. Why? My most serious concern is that uh, bad feelings are growing both sides of the border. So the anti-American feeling in Mexico is growing again, and the anti-Mexican or anti-Hispanic or anti-Latino and the immigrant feeling, feelings are growing here again. So what we need to do is to remember each other that we are neighbors, we are allies, and we are human persons, and we contribute each other to prosperity. To prosperity. And this common understanding is the, f the common field to build a real reform in that sector. Otherwise, it will be impossible to persuade the congressmen. Of course, they will realize sooner or later that there are a lot of citizens and voters supporting those initiatives, and those voters are growing. And that will be relevant either for Democrats or Republicans next year. So 
So we need to let them some time uh, to analyze that situation. No? But uh, it is possible to do so. The other is uh, Petromex. Uh, thank you for the suggestion, and it's a very good idea. However, <laughs> we have not gasoline even for our own people. So actually, one of my problems that I want to fix through this reform in Pemex is today for local consumption, we are importing 42% of the total gasoline we use in Mexico. So that's crazy. We are exporting oil and we are importing gasoline. So it is not Russian. So we need to improve the, the industry downstream and in order to do that, it's absolutely clear for me that the traditional effort of Pemex is not enough to produce gasoline, and that is absolutely clear. And we are suffering, by the way, with these prices in oil and gasoline. Suffering the oil prices because it's going to be a break to the economic growth here in the States and around the world, and suffering through gasoline prices because we are paying and importing, maybe from American companies, the gasoline that we use in our vehicles in Mexico. And no, I have, uh, we, I didn't ask, and I have no idea about the North Command trying to sponsorship security. Well, but what we have is a very good coordination between Mexican and American agencies, and that is good. Let me tell you, less than two years ago, my government, the Attorney General Office, published a list of uh, the 37 most wanted criminals in Mexico. And in a little bit more than one year, we ceased or neutralized uh, 20 out of those 37 criminals, and most of them with the support of the American agents in terms of information and intelligence. So it is working. And I think that is the, we have a common problem related with organized crime, and we must to have a common effort, and that is exactly wh what we are doing. And thank you for your comments about the, I can remember your question, sorry. You know, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> no, no, but let me tell you seriously, no. no first, I, 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 can, I can clarify through your question that my aim is not narco traffic itself. That is part of the problem. But what we are fighting against is organized crime as a whole because we are observing some kind of diversification of crime during the years. At the beginning, I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, the criminals only used to pass through Mexico towards the States, and that's it. It was like an only export industry, if I can say that. No? But now, suddenly, when Mexican income started to grow, and let me remember that during NAFTA, the income per capita in Mexico went up from $2,000 towards almost 10000 we have already. And that implied a very profitable market for vehicles, housing, uh, cosmetics, and of course drugs as well. And others say that the reason is because the Colombian dealers started paying, uh, not with money, but with cocaine itself, so the Mexican dealers needed to start a, a business of sales in Mexico. But the point is, in the last decade, it started a very profitable business, not only narco traffic into the U.S., but also a retail business in Mexico. As, as, as any other retailer, they are look, looking for to get power in any single point of sales either big cities or small towns in the country. That is the reason of the expansion of the cartels, not only in Mexico, but also in Central America. And the reason of the violence is because the cartels looking for power in, in, on territorial basis, they are fighting each other in order to have the control of the territory. Because it's not the same to have control in one single point of the border than to have the control in the whole area or territory of a city. Is I remember my, my lectures in terms of uh, 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 geometria analytica, 
So it's a change of dimension, no? It's not only a line or a point, it's a surface. So, the, the, uh, it, and it's absolutely different, the problem. So it's a very long explanation to say that I don't believe in this idea that it is possible to arrange with the criminals. That was a big mistake, and that was one of the reasons why Mexico is like this right now. That was the problem. Because you one day allow the criminals to do whatever they want. You are losing the battle since the very beginning. And that exactly happened in several parts of Mexico. I remember when one, what, one person <laughs> came to see me and say, President, help me to clean up my state because the criminals are everywhere. And I tell him, well, let me tell you. You are in your house, you are arriving late one day, and tell to your wife, you know, I have three nice guys you know, in the porch of the, of the house. So they are working for the neighborhood, only cleaning shoes and so on. They promise me, don't disturb us, and actually they will pay me a little bit. So don't worry for them. So several days later, you arrive to your home, and then you are going to have dinner, and you are trying to, to you arrive to the kitchen, and suddenly you, you found it, one of them eating your sandwich. And say, oh, I'm sorry. And, so, and one day, you arrive to your home, you are very tired, and suddenly, suddenly you, you find them exactly in your bedroom, and more precisely, in your bed. And then you say, I call you president, and I would say, please help me to clean up the house. And say, well, maybe it's too late, my friend. So this public policy in terms of, <laughs> so you can arrange. So this so-called public policy in which you can arrange some kind of deal with the criminals is not working at all. And I can see that example in several states now. Actually, there are some people recently arguing in favor of this policy. My perception is that that is not possible, or at least it's not possible anymore with the new business of the criminals, because either you allow them to do anything they want in your whole territory, so the best you can do is to give them the key of your house, or you combat them directly and with the full force of the state. There is no other option. Usually I used to ask, well, what is the problem? I, I listen everywhere. Change the strategy. It's a big mistake. You are wrong on that. OK, I will listen to you. What is your suggestion about the strategy? Well, you need to invest in education. No? So you need to invest in healthcare. So what we are doing is that, but what can I do with the criminals? Do I need to allow them to do whatever they want? Absolutely not. It's a problem like a <laughs> So uh, my point is, uh, and I'm sorry because I, I, I think I, I need to, to close very soon. I, <laughs> I, own, I own the other three questions. Maybe next occasion, but uh, it's like other example they have. No, suddenly there is a very young doctor who arrives to a new town. No, <laughs> and then there is a patient who goes to see the doctor and say, "You know, doctor, I had some pain in my stomach. I used to to cure that with some tea and some uh, family medical receipts." But it's not useful anymore. Maybe you can give me some advice about, oh, let me check that. I say, whoa, oh, you are really sick? Maybe you need an intervention? Let me do that. So the doctor make an intervention and discover that this guy has cancer. So the doctor operate the patient, subtract the tumor, and say, my friend, you are on time, but almost you could lose this, but you will need radiation and chemotherapy, chemotherapy and so on. And say to the guy, well, okay.
But two months later, after the radiation, losing the hair and so on, the guy say, oh, come on, this doctor is the problem. Why? Because I was very healthy before he arrives to the town. No? <laughs> now I lose my hair. I have a lot of pain. So the problem is the doctor. It's not a cancer. No, I'm fighting a cancer in Mexico, and we will cure Mexico. And regarding the question... And reg finally, regarding the question about if uh, there are two questions, uh, two questions actually. If the PRI is going to be in power again, <laughs> so the answer is in the voters. And assuming that PRI could be in power again, are they going to keep the policy fighting organized crime? So the answer, is, I have not the answer. They have the answer. No, I cannot answer. I cannot answer that. But it could be better if you can ask them about that. No, but my perception is we need to keep this policy. Of course, we can fix. Actually, we are trying to check and correct the strategy on a daily basis, depending on the conditions. But at the very end. Mexico must to recover the authority of the law. And we are doing so, and we will get it. And I hope next government could do the same. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Mr. President, uh, on, on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Council of the Americas, over which I uh, happen to preside, uh, we want to thank you for coming to speak uh, to us uh, this afternoon and being so generous in your willingness to entertain questions uh, directly uh, from the floor. I had the feeling today from watching your press conference with President Obama, and from the few remarks uh, that we were able to exchange shortly before our meeting this afternoon, that you had a successful meeting with our President. And so I think that in and of itself uh, makes this uh, a very important uh, visit that you have undertaken to Washington. But I also think it's been an excellent opportunity for you to clear the air a little bit here uh, with a public audience of uh, people, uh, thought leaders, and others who are interested uh, in our relations with Mexico uh, to give them a better understanding, a much more complete understanding that they could possibly gain from reading the headlines of our newspapers. So we thank you for that. And we're, uh, uh, I, I know I speak for both of our organizations in saying that we're, we're more than prepared to continue working uh, with your country, with your uh, think tanks and your institutions uh, to try and make sure that the American people have the best possible understanding of what is happening in the country of Mexico. And lastly, let me uh, congratulate you for the great leadership that you are providing to your country and the, uh, the heroic nature of the efforts uh, that you have undertaken. Uh, if I could just ask uh, those of you in the audience to uh, Remain seated to allow time for the President and his delegation uh, to uh, leave uh, the room. And uh, on that note, uh, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.